Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Town of Leland's Resilient Coastal Communities Program public meeting. Uh, we will give everyone a couple more minutes to log on. Uh, we're currently here at Town Hall, and I'm here with uh, Rachel Baker, one of our team members, and Adriana Weber, and we will hold on to see if uh, additional folks jump on. Thank you so much. All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Dawn York, uh, project manager and senior coastal planner with Moffitt and Nickel, coastal engineering firm here in Wilmington, North Carolina. And we are here tonight uh, at Town Hall in Town of Leland to uh, discuss with you the North Carolina Resilient Coastal Communities Program. Um, it is a few minutes after six o'clock, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. I'd like to start our presentation off tonight um, by first welcoming you, and again, thank you for joining us um, this evening. Uh, understand that everyone has um, family to attend to and dinner to eat and on uh, an evening to enjoy. So we're gonna keep this um, as brief as possible. But again, um, the focus of our uh, meeting tonight and our presentation is just to give you an overview of the Resilient Coastal Communities Program and the Town of Leland's um, goals and objectives uh, with this program. And most importantly is to get input and any questions or concerns from you. Uh, we really are sincerely interested in receiving your input. Um, but first, let me go ahead and introduce our team. Uh, we do have here quite a diverse uh, group of specialists and scientists um, with our team to participate and make sure that this project is a success. So first, I'd like to introduce Samantha Burdick, who is the Coastal Resilience Coordinator with the North Carolina Division of Coastal Management. And we also have with us here in Town Hall, Adriana Weber, a town engineer for the town of Leland. And uh, we also have uh, virtually from Raleigh, Mike Robinson with Moffin Nickel. He is our Resilience and Hazard Mitigation Technical Director. Uh, we also have Rachel Baker here in Town Hall, um, our coastal environmental scientist. And last but not least, Amanda Zulo, our community outreach specialist out of Charlotte. So again, thank you to our team for making this possible tonight. Um, looking forward to uh, going over the presentation with you and uh, again, getting any questions or comments and feedback from the group. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and pass it over to Samantha with the North Carolina Division of Coastal Management. Great. Thanks, Don. Uh, can you hear me OK? Yes, ma'am. And if, um, if everyone else can mute your um, microphones, that would be helpful to reduce feedback. Thank you. Great, thanks. Uh, so again, as Don mentioned, I am Sam Burdick. I'm the Coastal Resilience Coordinator with the North Carolina, sorry, Coordinator with the North Carolina Division of Coastal Management. Uh, today, I'm just going to briefly touch on uh, an overview of the program. Uh, so, the program originated uh, last year. It is a new program, essentially a grant program targeted for local governments in coastal North Carolina, uh, such as Leland, uh, to help local governments uh, really increase their capacity 
uh, an ability to develop uh, uh, robust strategies to address uh, various different coastal and climate hazards that are continuing to increase. So uh, essentially, we have provided the town uh, with funding to uh, develop, as I mentioned, that resilience strategy. Uh, and this program is made up of several phases. I'll, I'll go through those first. The risk and vulnerability assessment is phase one. Phase two is planning, project selection, and prioritization. Phase three is engineering and design. And then phase four is implementation. Uh, and one thing of note is that the two phases listed here are really what uh, we're beginning to work on in this initiative for the town of Leland. Uh, so again, uh, we provided funding and technical assistance for the town to develop a resilient strategy. And what that will look like is really a, a uh, comprehensive uh, deep dive into the vulnerabilities of the community uh, and then a develop, the development of a portfolio of projects uh, that are aimed to reduce, uh, reduce the impacts and increase resilience in the town. Uh, we really hope to, to have this be a uh, locally driven, uh, inclusive and, and forward thinking process. Uh, and we really would like to incentivize the use of nature-based solutions uh, like natural and nature-based uh, and excuse me, innovative solutions such as natural and nature-based solutions. Um, those are things like living shorelines or different green infrastructure projects. Next slide, please. Uh, and so, as I mentioned, this is a, a new program. We launched it late last year uh, and had uh, a number of, of uh, applications from communities uh, we were able to fund and select 26 uh, mapped here, uh, and of course, including the town of Leland. Um, we're working also with a number of different uh, planning consultants and uh, Council of Government, uh, aside from Moffat and, and Nickel, uh, with the various communities there. Um, then lastly, I do want to recognize our major partners, our uh, the North Carolina Office of Recovery and Resiliency, uh, North Carolina Sea Grant, and the Nature Conservancy. Uh, and then lastly, I just would like to touch on uh, what DCM's role will be in this process. And really, uh, we are the grant administrators on behalf of the town and also are here to provide, you know, an advisory and supportive role throughout the process. All right, and that is all I have. Um, unfortunately, you'll no longer be able to reach me at this email. Uh, I have accepted a position with the town of Beaufort, uh, but our uh, coastal resilience specialist, Mackenzie Todd, and our uh, policy, uh, excuse me, planning and policy section chief, Tankard Miller, will be taking over uh, and helping uh, with, or helping to be the DCM point of contact from here on out. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Adriana, it looks like you are muted. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Let's start that again. All right, so. My name is Adriana Weber. I am from the town of Leland. Um, I am going to briefly speak about kind of why the town applied as well as what we're looking forward um, out of this program. So to start, Leland, uh, due to the location of Leland, we're susceptible to high precipitation events, erosion and riverine flooding. Um, in addition, we've seen rapid growth throughout the past uh, decade or so. Um, and we believe that this program will increase the town's resiliency uh, to ensure the prosperity of the town for many years to come. Next slide. So we are looking forward to both deliverables from this program. The first being a risk and vulnerability assessment, as it has been over 10 years since we've conducted our last risk and vulnerability assessment. Um, throughout this decade, we have also seen rapid growth as a previously mentioned, um, which we would believe would have changed this, the outcome from that previous study. 
In addition, we look forward to the projects portfolio that will be um, delivered from Moffat and Nickel, um, and we can use future grant program or opportunities uh, to fund different projects that are outlined throughout this program um, and better increase our resiliency within the town. Next slide. And if you have any questions or any comments throughout this pro program, um, please don't hesitate to contact me. Um, my email is on the screen as well as on the website. And I will pass it over to, to Don. All right, thank you, Adriana. And just to provide an overview, uh, Moffitt Nickel, um, as a coastal engineering firm, have been in uh, working in North Carolina for several decades, and want to just you know give you an understanding of sort of our team's expertise and lessons learned with the various designs, resiliency designs that we have developed for many coastal communities across the state. Um, as you'll see here in the graphic on the right, um, we've illustrated several different types of nature-based projects that we feel are uh, not necessarily um, those that may be utilized or implemented in the town of Leland. However, all of these projects provide some level of lessons learned that our design team, our planning team, have learned over the years to improve design standards and principles in coastal resiliency. Um, as we all understand, you know, as climate change has um, you know, impacted us all, those different impacts um, and inundation and, and effects have caused us to kind of rethink and outside the box and become more innovative um, in, in working in our challenging environment. So certainly, again, uh, resiliency planning and design that we will consider um, over the course of this program is really trying to ensure that we apply the standards so that the community can withstand and recover quickly. So again, you know, resiliency um, in its purest form is about creating responsible and practical solutions for the community and the residents to, to recover. Um, in the event um, of, of this situation of this program, we want to be sure that you know, the resiliency plan, the risk and vulnerability assessment includes the needs and desires of the community. So again, it's really making sure that we receive feedback and any type of input from the community, such as yourselves or your neighbors, or you know other industrial or commercial users, and and those that uh, utilize and live within uh, the town of Leland. So as Sam had mentioned before, uh, we're currently um, in phase one. Uh, we will be uh, focusing on phase one and phase two. Phase one being uh, specific to community engagement and developing the risk and vulnerability assessment. Um, as you'll see here, we have been able to complete several steps. However, um, we are in the process of continuing to review existing local plans and efforts, and also using the feedback and input that we have received through the public survey. So again, thank you so much for taking the time. We've had over 100 folks um, take the survey and Amanda can speak to that in a little bit, um, but that has been all very important information that we will use to map critical assets and natural infrastructure, but also help us to understand, you know, really where we need to focus our risk and vulnerability assessment. And of course, phase two um, is kind of really where everyone wants to be. Uh, we want to be able to plan and identify projects and, and get them shovel ready. We want to be able to identify those potential solutions that Sam had mentioned. However, we need to be able to go through the planning process, understand again, what are the priorities um, of the community specific to the town of Leland so that we can help prioritize um, where those potential projects can be located. So as you'll see in this uh, schedule, we have been able to complete uh, quite a few steps within phase one. Um, however, you know, with this public meeting, this is a critical part of the overall process. Um, again, our next step would be to um, evaluate and conduct a risk and vulnerability assessment, um, hopefully over the next several months. 
and be able to come back to our community action team um, later this summer, early fall, to be able to evaluate and identify, you know, where we have um, illustrated those risks and the vulnerabilities and where we need to, to take next steps. So certainly we look forward to keeping all of you involved in the process and certainly would love to make sure that we stay in touch and, and we anticipate that the uh, phase one and phase two will be completed by the end of 2021 and finalized report to the town of Leland uh, early next year. We do anticipate um, wanting and, and with the desire to be sure that the town of Leland is ready and aligned with any potential grant uh, funding opportunities that may become available and want to be sure that they have identified those potential solutions and, and projects so that they can be ready to go when the funding becomes available. And with that, I'd like to pass it over to Amanda Zulo, our Community Outreach Specialist. Great, thank you, Don, and good evening, everyone. We really appreciate you joining us this evening. Um, we have been working very closely with Adriana from the town of Leland to develop this community engagement strategy. Tonight is one milestone in the process, as Don alluded to earlier. And again, just to reiterate what both Sam and Don had mentioned, this process really is um, very much derived at a local level. We want it to be as inclusive as possible, and so we've created a series series of tools, techniques, and strategies to solicit your feedback and your input. Um, as Don just showed on the schedule, we've created a series of meetings for both the community action team. They're all, um, you know, meeting at various uh, milestones in the project, and we really wanted to, you know, encapsulate what the public was saying by offering this meeting right in the heart of when we're still, you know, digging through the vulnerability assessment research. So your feedback is is very valuable. It's very important to our effort. And we hope that tonight proves um, a fruitful use of your time. And we hope that you can uh, contribute to the discussion later. In addition to the meetings that provide more of a in-person or hybrid uh, and virtual, uh, you know, get together with the project team, we've worked with Adriana to create a project web page. Um, we'll show that link on the next slide, but the web page is, you know, very well robust. It has all the information about the project. It has the link to the survey. It provides a series of planning resources that are available for you to review and download, and it really is kind of that storing house of information information relating to this uh, program. The image on the right is the project information fact sheet. Uh, you might have seen that, you know, dispersed through Leland social media. Um, perhaps Adriana had forwarded it to you in an email. And that one pager really just kind of provides a high level overview of the project and, um, you know, shows the intent of the project, how the public can play a role, the schedule and Adriana's contact information if you have any questions. Uh, as Don had mentioned, we we really wanted to leverage um, public engagement. So in addition to this meeting, we created a public participation survey. The survey is, is really a great way for you to share your concerns, your feedback, um, any priorities and preferences, and any other type of information you feel would better suit the, the planning team to understand. Um, in addition to that, we've worked with Adriana to develop a series of social media posts for outbound communication, as well as help provide information that could be used for uh, press releases, printed material, such as the, the fact sheet over there, and any information that can help uh, you know, further expand the outreach communication we are uh, working on for, for this project. So there are some various ways to get involved. Um, Mike, if you don't mind just copying those website links into the chat, I'd greatly appreciate it. Um, we had mentioned, you know, you can go to the project website, you can subscribe on the website, uh, and you can also follow Leland social media accounts and email the team directly from there. That link, um, you know, is is where we will be updating information on the website, so you're welcome to check back in over the course of the project and obtain more information as we go along. We really would appreciate any and everyone's input on that public survey and 
it says 120, but I just checked. We are at 130 survey participants already. So thank you. Thank you everyone who took the 10 or so minutes to provide your feedback. Um, the survey will be open until mid September. And again, the team is harnessing that information and incorporating it into our uh, research um, and that will help inform the risk and vulnerability assessment. In addition to the survey, we uh, will be looking at some maps this evening. Uh, Rachel will be sharing those here soon. And Adriana will be uploading the maps uh, via JPEGs to the website. As she has also um, going to be working on creating a comment form. That comment form will allow you the opportunity to look at the maps in further detail on your own time. Um, and then you'll be able to send any comments that you want to share with the project team through there. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Mike to discuss the hazard mitigation planning overview. Great, great. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, just a few points on hazard mitigation planning that I would like to uh, really sort of point out and, and talk about a little bit today. Uh, some of you may be familiar with uh, past hazard mitigation planning uh, efforts uh, that may sound a lot like what we're, we're talking about here tonight. Um, hazard mitigation planning has long been a foundational element in North Carolina's resilience to natural hazards. And uh, the town of Leland is part of a regional hazard mitigation plan uh, that does include uh, a risk assessment and mitigation uh, goals and actions. And so our, our intent here, our desire is not to reinvent the wheel or, or do things that have already been done, have meetings that have already been held, but rather to build upon and go beyond those traditional hazard mitigation planning practices and really focus on those new elements of resiliency that are emerging, that we're beginning to understand more, um, not just looking at the built environment, for example, but looking at social, social vulnerability and economics and, and other factors like that. Uh, so this does mean that we will utilize existing hazard mitigation resources and, and principles, those plans, policies, ordinances, things that are already in place uh, at the local level and, and also regionally and at the state level. But we do want to enhance and expand our resiliency efforts for the town of Leland. And part of that will be, this is a question that we get asked a lot um, as we talk about, um, as we begin to identify potential projects, how do we decide what we're going to do and, and what order are we going to do them in? How are we going to prioritize them? How are we going to prioritize funding? Uh, that is a, a step in the process and something that we will be looking at uh, here in phase two. So we won't just be identifying potential projects, but we'll be making uh, an effort to identify in what order we would recommend uh, they be done in for various reasons and looking at it from different, uh, different perspectives. So on the next slide, I begin, we talk uh, a little bit about uh, the risk and vulnerability assessment, and I'll make a few uh, comments here about this. Um, you know, the first question that we can ask is, what is a, a risk and vulnerability assessment? And you specifically may ask, what are your risks in terms of your, uh, your home, your business, uh, schools in your area? Um, so as we look at, at how we define risk and vulnerability, there are really uh, three components to this study. Uh, one is exposure, one is vulnerability, and one is risk. And just very, very briefly, um, looking at exposure, that asks the question of whether or not uh, a structure or an asset is exposed to the flood hazard. And again, that is one of the, the main things that we're focusing on here uh, are different types of, of flooding. But what what is exposed to the flood hazard? But beyond that, how vulnerable is it? A, a structure, a, a home or a business may be located in the floodplain, but if it's elevated, if it's flood proofed, um, those things can minimize its vulnerability. And when we talk about risk, we look at the value of that property, the value of the contents, um, whether or not the property owner carries flood insurance. So uh, the first question is, you know, are these things exposed to the flood hazard? If so, are they vulnerable and to what extent are they vulnerable? And then what is the financial, social, uh, or economic risk associated with flood damages in the future? So I mentioned the flood hazard. Our, our primary focus right now is on natural hazards. I know many of you may be concerned about uh, things like global pandemics and, and other uh, human caused hazards, but right now we're really focused on natural hazards and specifically, the flood hazard, but we can break that down into some specific 
um, hazard types, looking at coastal and riverine flooding, uh, uh, what we call floodplain inundation. I'm sure most of you have probably heard of, of FEMA flood zones and that type of thing. Uh, we'll be talking more about that here in just a moment. Uh, but also storm surge from tropical storms and hurricanes, sea level rise, uh, increases in precipitation over time, and also stormwater management and what we call urban flooding, street flooding, uh, things like that as we look at drainage and things of that nature. And so our goal is to show uh, the potential impacts uh, of these different types of flooding on community assets and the built environment and looking not just at current conditions today, but also looking at future conditions. How will these uh, hazard risks change over time and how will our built environment change over time? And the practical side of all this is as we identify and learn more about our risk, that will lead directly into those um, solutions or project ideas that we identify. So they are, they're supposed to be risk-based. Uh, so not just a, an idea that you know someone brainstorms, but how does that actually reduce risk that we've identified? And again, that can relate to exposure, vulnerability, and uh, those financial and, and uh, economic impacts. So with that, I think I'm going to turn it over now to Rachel, who's going to talk a little bit about uh, the history of resilience in the town and also go through uh, some of our preliminary maps for us as well. So Rachel? Great, thank you so much, Mike. Um, so this is Rachel Baker with Moffat and Nickel. I'm here in Town Hall in Leland. Um, so I will be talking about um, resiliency and the history of resilience efforts in the town of Leland, as well as current and ongoing, as well as previous efforts within the town uh, to address some of these natural hazards that we just heard more about from Mike. Uh, so part of our risk and vulnerability assessment was we wanted to conduct an initial evaluation of studies, projects, um, as well as other efforts made by the town of Leland to address some of these natural hazards and what threats the town has experienced in the past. Um, so this is looking at things like major storm events and the associated flooding events that the town has experienced. This timeline represents a comprehensive assessment of all of those threats um, and previous and ongoing resiliency efforts. Um, so I'm not going to go through each of these bullet points um, because there are quite a few, as we can see, which is a very good thing. Uh, the town of Leland has been very proactive, as we can see, with addressing a lot of these natural hazards um, and really moving forward with these resilience efforts. So it's a really important visual for us to look at and understand and be able to refer back to just to really understand that looking at resilience is not a brand new idea. The town of Leland, like I said, has been very proactive so far um, in addressing a lot of these natural hazards. It is important to see that there have been other ongoing projects in the past, and we're only continuing these efforts with this program. So next slide, please. This first map, uh, Mike talked a little bit about the difference between exposure, risk, and vulnerability. So this first map uh, displays um, exposure using uh, flood zones from FEMA. So you'll see there's three categories of flood zones. So these terms you may not all be familiar with, so I'll break these down a little bit. Uh, minimal risk refers to these areas that where we don't want to necessarily say that there's no risk of flooding at all. We do have to keep in mind that Leland is in Southeast North Carolina, so there's always a risk of flooding a little bit. Um, chances are minimal compared to some of these other areas, but we don't want to say it's zero. So that is also why we really emphasize the importance of um, everyone getting flood insurance, um, no matter where you live along this map. So um, the other terms, if you are not familiar with them, 100-year flood and 500-year flood zones, these flood zones basically mean that um, there is a 1% chance if you're in the 100-year flood zone or a 0.2% chance if you're in the 500-year flood zone of being inundated by floodwaters. Um, this does not necessarily mean that once every 100 years or once every 500 years, these areas will be inundated by floodwaters. It just means that this is a probability of these areas being inundated. This map also overlays critical features within the town of Leland just to demonstrate um, the importance of looking at where these areas are located um, and, and looking at flood zones for these critical features as well. 
Next slide, please. So looking some more at the built environment, just like with the last slide, uh, this map also looks at flood zones compared to the built environment, but instead of some of those critical features, we're looking at land parcels in general. So we're looking at uh, what types of built environment we have on these types of land parcels. So we have commercial land, we have industrial, residential, as well as parks and open space. So we're looking at where these types of parcels overlay with these flood zones. So it's important, to, again, to understand where these flood zones um, interact with our built environment. Next slide, please. So these next three maps look at storm surge. Uh, we don't necessarily want to call these storm surge impacts. Um, the impacts, of course, vary based on the flooding events and the precipitation events, but these maps rather represent the area that will be inundated by floodwaters with each type of uh, storm event. So with a Category 1 hurricane storm event, this area that we see in the blue will be inundated by floodwaters. Um, this area came from NOAA, um, this, where this data was obtained. So we can see here, just like as we saw with Hurricane Florence, which was the Category 1, this is the area that will be inundated by flooding. Next slide, please. So skipping ahead to category three, category three is important to understand in terms of hurricanes because this is where we cross into a major storm event. So we see here um, with a major storm so, such as a category three, um, this entire area in blue and green and yellow um, on the map will be inundated by flood water. So it's important to recognize this difference. Next slide, please. And now moving forward, we have a Category 5 hurricane. Uh, this, this type of storm event has not been seen in the town of Leland um, on record, but it is important to consider as a worst case scenario. So it is not highly probable, but it is possible. And again, important for us to consider when looking at these natural hazards. Um, so any questions or feedback you have on these maps, please feel free to put in the chat or we can address some of these questions at the end or feel free again to give your feedback um, with Adriana's feedback uh, at the end. All right, and I will hand this back over to Dawn to talk about our next steps moving forward. All right, great. Thank you, Rachel, and thanks, uh, Mike. Um, so what's next? Uh, basically, using uh, public input and staff knowledge, uh, we are uh, wanting to develop a community-specific vision and goals to ensure that the Town of Leland uh, values and priorities are considered throughout the entire process. Uh, we want to make sure that the vision and the goals are very specific to this program and take into account the time frame in which the resiliency planning um, will account for through the risk, the risk and vulnerability analysis. Uh, we also want to continue reviewing additional data sources and resources necessary to complete the risk and vulnerability assessment. Uh, Rachel um, briefly went over some of the preliminary results. However, there are many other data sources that we need to evaluate and we're continuing to reach out to our state and federal uh, resources agencies and partners and stakeholders to be sure that we are able to evaluate all data uh, that is available. Also, um, again, as I briefly mentioned um, previously in phase two, um, we'll be moving forward with identifying potential nature-based solutions to improve resilience. Um, this will come after the development of the vulnerability assessment is complete to be sure that we understand where to focus within the community. Again, it is uh, critical to receive community uh, input on those, uh, those areas that we want to focus on to be sure that we account for any localized flooding or observations during some of the storm events that were mentioned previously. So last but not least, you know, we need your help. We want to know from the community, are there other data sources that you are aware of? Um, are there other agencies or stakeholders that we should reach out to for information? 
And what are your thoughts on the engagement strategy that Amanda presented? Um, how can we best reach out to those vulnerable communities that may not be represented here tonight? And last but not least, you know, most importantly, what are the greatest risks and vulnerabilities and priorities you see for the town of Leland? We would love to hear your voices tonight. Um, we are here for, you know, as long as it takes to get through any questions or comments. Um, please feel free to um, provide comments in the chat box. I see there are several comments and I'll ask Amanda or Mike to maybe read those out loud and, and we can certainly discuss those tonight. And of course, my email and my phone number are there for you to reach out at any point in time. You can reach out to the Division of Coastal Management or again, Adriana Weber with the Town of Leland. And certainly anyone on our team is available for, for further conversations or discussions. So I'm gonna go ahead and open it up and, and Mike or Amanda, if you wanna perhaps um, list out some of the, read out loud some of the questions. I, I will, Don. This is Mike. Uh, I know Amanda's kind of tied up with the, the PowerPoint slides there, but um, one question that has come in, because of the incredibly rapid growth in Leland, does this effort address and identify the potential need for evacuation, additional evacuation facilities in our local area? And is there federal funding available for any needed evacuation facilities in the infrastructure bill? And I'll pause there for us to respond to that. And then there is a, a second part uh, to their question as well. Yeah, that's a great one. Um, I I think, you know, so I guess Adriana is here with me in town hall, and I don't know if there has been any discussions regarding the need for additional evacuation facilities. I don't know if facilities is referring to evacuation corridors um, or routes. Um, so I'll pause there and, and let Adriana Um, so yeah, so we, I do know that there's a couple of um, evacuation shelters within the town limits as well that we could add to our data, um, uh, data kind of, yeah, analysis of this whole program. Um, as for actual corridors and, um, and additional evacuation routes routes we have not i do not know of any data at this moment um, but this is definitely something that we can look for into um, during this program and it's something that i didn't even think about so thank you for bringing that up yeah and i would like to note that we have developed a community action team and we did meet um, recently in the last month or so and the mpo um, is represented on the committee and does bring in that transportation, that regional transportation, um, you know, planning knowledge of, of what other transportation corridors or projects that are being planned. So certainly I think that's, that, that is very critical. Um, the second question, is there any federal funding available for these uh, evacuation facilities in the infrastructure bill? And I'm not aware, but I will ask Mike if perhaps um, you have a little bit more insight into the federal infrastructure bill and, and how that may play a role in local communities providing um, additional evacuation or emergency facilities. I, I actually do not. One, one point that I would make kind of going along with what we're talking about is we were talking earlier about identifying project ideas. Um, those don't have to just be, um, uh, what, what can I say, brick and mortar, uh, moving dirt type projects. Um, they can be activities such as um, exploring uh, existing policies and ordinances. I see there's also a question about building codes, uh, but looking into uh, funding opportunities and, and what is in the language of the infrastructure bill that would be appropriate or, or applicable. Uh, to the town of Leland, those can be identified as actions or, or projects um, as well. So they don't have to be the, the physical brick and mortar type projects that we probably kind of picture when we use the word projects, but we can certainly look into to these things. And I will mention on infrastructure, um, 
FEMA does have a new grant program that started last year called Building Resilient Infrastructure and in Communities, or BRIC, uh, is the acronym. And one of the, the main emphases of the BRIC program that you even see in the title of it is infrastructure. And so I think that that's something that uh, a lot of communities in North Carolina are looking at. Uh, we did have several successful applications uh, under the BRIC program last year, and uh, we're working with communities now on applying for funding. There is a billion dollars available for that program next year, but that is nationwide uh, and it is competitive. So we can certainly look at opportunities if, um, you know, for under under infrastructure, if we are looking at additional evacuation shelters or or evacuation planning, uh, those are those are types of things that are eligible uh, for that type of funding. And just kind of moving on, I'll mention uh, the follow up question to that as well. Uh, are there any parts of our building code that could be bolstered so that our citizens could shelter in place in their homes for lower level hurricanes instead of having to evacuate? So uh, this is Adriana. Um, I am I am not completely familiar with our building code, um, but I can definitely reach out to our building chief and, uh, officer um, to see kind of how we can kind of e or explore that question um, and see if there is anything within the building code that can um, you know increase the 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 sh shelter capacity of the houses that are created within the town. Um, so I will have to phone a friend per se and, and get back to you on that on that on that point right there. Next question, I believe from the same uh, source. Are you evaluating connector and collector roads for evacuation needs? Um, and also going along with the evacuation theme, are we identifying vulnerable residents that may be less able to evacuate? Yeah, hey Mike, this is uh, Dawn. I, those are great questions and we are certainly writing them all down. Um, with regards to the connector and, and collector roads, absolutely, you know, the program evaluates the entire town limits. Um, we understand that there are um, potential um, expansions into the future and, you know, certainly that will be evaluated as well. Um, but some of those those localized flooding, those neighborhoods um, along some of the, even the minor um, tributaries, not necessarily along the major um, river system is, is something that we would be evaluating um, more closely. So if there are observations or specific um, roads or locations that you think we need to take a close look at, um, certainly please email us addresses or you know, a, a screenshot of, of your Google map. I mean, we would be happy to understand that a little bit further. So very, very good question. Uh, and I next guess, question that I, yeah, I'm sorry, Don, go ahead. No, no, no I guess, um, Mike, I just want to make sure that second question, are we identifying vulnerable residents that make, that may be less um, able to evacuate? Um, certainly too, that is something of, of concern and, and significance for us. We want to be, sure that this program is all inclusive um, of all residents so we would you know really ask the folks on the phone and or who are listening to this presentation at a later time to please let us know you know what are those vulnerable communities that we should be sure to reach out to and and understand the risk and vulnerabilities in those specific areas so again if there are particular communities or neighborhoods that we should focus on, you know, that is the information that we are seeking. And, and along with that, Don, I'll mention as well, in, in the past we've looked at um, census data that, that's available either federally or through the state uh, that does have some attributes that are useful for that, looking at households that, for example, uh, may not have a vehicle, uh, may not have uh, a telephone in order to receive um, phone calls related to evacuation, uh, may not have um, uh, different uh, different access may have accessibility uh, challenges, issues. 
um, language barriers, things like that, that we could uh, potentially look at as well to help identify, especially in terms of receiving information, receiving alerts and warnings, um, information about evacuation. Um, we can certainly look at uh, some of that demographic uh, information as well within the, the GIS that we've been talking about. But certainly your input and, and feedback, as, as Don said, would be would be very, very helpful with that. Yeah, good. So point. another question uh, moving on to uh, another topic here. Um, have we reached out to business partners? Um, Harris Teeter had a generator during Florence, but it was knocked out during the storm. What can we do to protect key business partners that provide goods and services that are critical post storms? Yeah, and I, uh, I that's a really good point. Um, this is Adriana from the town, um, and I think one of the things that I definitely believe that that we need to an analyze throughout this program is both residential as well as commercial um, facilities within the town. Um, and to to your point about Harris Teeter having a generator during Florence, um, we we need to reach out to them and see what their capabilities are and see what other bigger commercial um, facilities within the town, what their capabilities are um, to help uh, provide a shelter or provide some sort of help throughout the for the residents of Leland. Um, and so, so I think as as the town, I don't I as the the town of Leland should be looking at this program for both residents as well as commercial individuals uh, throughout this this program. So, um, I would like to have you know Martha and Nickel and, and I can help throughout this pro process as well to to look at those and to to make sure that we we are identifying the key businesses within our town um, and seeing what they need from from the town so that we can help them in the long run, which then also can help the town um, as well. Yeah, and I guess, um, you know, that brings up a good point, Mike, in that, you know, to be sure that folks understand when we move into phase two and identifying potential solutions to improve resiliency, that may not come in the form of uh, moving dirt and, and building a, you know, some type of green infrastructure project. It may come in the form of, collaborating with business partners to ensure that you know they have um, the the services utilities that the needs to either stay open and or you know provide goods during emergency um, or duress conditions so again i think you know one of the potential solutions could be you know just the the collaborative uh, partnerships or you know ongoing communications with with partners in the community so <clears throat> there is some type of <clears throat> action plan in place great and a comment here uh, something for us to to make note of uh, because fema flood maps assume uh, that all i believe this is that all bridges and drains are clear and flowing freely uh, will you be evaluating the impact when these facilities are blocked or occluded? Uh, for example, with a 100-year flood uh, becoming a 500-year flood event. And, and so I think this, this goes along with what we were talking about a little bit earlier in terms of looking at uh, future conditions and as, as flooding, uh, we anticipate flooding to increase. Uh, over time, um, but you're, you're exactly right. I mean, when, when we look at the FEMA flood zones, they do tend to show current conditions. It is uh, more or less a static uh, flood boundary, uh, looking at that, the extent of, of, again, what we call the 100-year floodplain. You know, all or part of that may flood in a 100-year event. Um, you know, parts of it may see more than, than others. It, it is, uh, there are limitations to that uh, basic data set and, you know, going along with, with what Don was just saying, I mean, one of our actions as well can be, you know, looking into creating new data and doing more detailed studies uh, over time that, that may be, you know, so big and, and um, you know, so uh, expansive that they may be considered a project in and of themselves to, to do a detailed study to look at, um, you know, different types of, of flooding in more detail and, and shoreline change and, and different things like that. So 
Uh, great point. We will certainly make note of that. Any anyone else want to comment on that question before we we move on? No, I think you did a good job, Mike. Thank you. So next question uh, or comment here. The senior center did not have a generator during Florence uh, and provides meals on wheels that many of our seniors depend on for nutrition. Uh, so many of our key nonprofit partners also need to be part of this discussion since they provide services to our residents. So perhaps we can speak a little bit more to our uh, public involvement and stakeholder engagement. Yeah, and th so this is Adriana from the town. Um, I, there is, I know we, uh, or I know uh, that we did point out that the senior, the Brunswick Senior Center um, as a, one of the critical features throughout the town. Um, I, uh, I will also reach out to, you know, the county and, and see, kind of get a better, get a point of contact for that, that, um, that facility um, so that we can make sure that we add this and, and, and see what their concerns are for flooding and, and other storm events um, so that we can add their information into this program. So very good point. Thank you. Great. And next up, uh, many developers are stripping the land for houses. This seems to be a problem for future floods. How do we change this? Yes, this is Adriana from the town um, again, and we have received um, a couple of comments to this similar, uh, this similar um, concern. And I know uh, through these new developments that yes, the 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 land is being disturbed. However, there are um, there are permits and and other requirements that once these developments are put in, um, they do have to abide by different stormwater controls and stuff like that. Um, however, we we know regionally that we would like to increase the resiliency within the town. Um, and this includes, includes those developments. And we know that as the town grows and there's more developments and, and maybe there's some more disturbed earth um, that we have to relook at a couple of these developments and say, hey, you know, when they were put in, this is what was required then, but is that sufficient to protect our citizens? Um, and if it isn't, then that's kind of uh, what maybe we need to look at. And I think this is a good first step into that process. Great. So do we want to pause here maybe? And, and Don, do you have any questions there uh, in person uh, where you are that you might want to switch over to? No, Mike, um, we do not have any other questions here in town hall. Um, we certainly would be happy to take additional questions. Um, I would like to add to Adriana's comment about, you know, evaluating ordinances existing ordinances on and on development um, you know as again part of our community action team um, we are um, discussing these types of uh, programs with the parks and recs department and certainly you know open space uh, conservation of land really trying to maybe evaluate city owned or town owned parcels to identify and determine what can be um, preserved um, there and also looking at, you know, additional riparian buffers. Those are all potential resiliency solutions that could be evaluated in the next phase. And one more question uh, that has come in uh, through the chat as you were talking there, Don. Uh, looking out to say the year 2045, flood and sea level rise models indicate that the approaches across the Cape Fear Memorial Bridge will periodically flood during extreme weather events. Will leaders have to consider resilience improvements on the causeway? Uh, this is also an important evacuation route as well. So specific to the Cape Fear Memorial Bridge. Yes, this is Adriana. Um, so I know 
that the town is currently conducting a um, comprehensive, a 2045 comprehensive uh, land use plan. And I believe through this, um, this or through their preliminary efforts, um, we are also using the data and, and the resources that they receive for this program. Um, I am um, unaware of the, of the um, consequences to the, the Cape Fear Memorial Bridge as of the 2045 um, year. However, um, if this is a concern, we can, um, we'll definitely work with, with other local leaders and other local municipalities to, to verify that this is, um, this is something that we can make sure that the evacuation route is, is available for our residents and that the resiliency as a regional, um, is a regional effort instead of just you know, within the municipality's limits. Um, I believe, you know, through the town is so close to all these other municipalities, such as Navassa and the county parcels, and there's um, Belleville and, and even on the other side of the river. Um, and resiliency will have to work as a collaborative approach and make sure that we, we look at it as a more regional um, event so that everyone around this area is, um, is safe and protected. Let's see, I believe one more just came in. Let me scroll back down to that. Uh, looks like at one point during Florence, Leland was an island. We could not get out. Are we looking at those evacuation routes that the town has no control over? And this is Adriana again. And yes, we, we did provide this information to um, to this program and to Moffat and Nickel, um, we were aware and we have those areas mapped out um, so that we can um, make sure that, you know, it, they're addressed within this program. Um, and if they are, as, you know, Florence indicated, you know, they did kind of isolate Leland a little bit and make it an island. And um, with this program, I think it would be um, a good, uh, good start to start those conversations with, with the roads that we might not own um, with those other uh, agencies such as NCDOT or, or WMPO um, and, and say, hey, this is something that caused some stress and some concern with this sort of storm. Are there any um, future plans to help mitigate this? And what, what, is, what can Leland do to help mitigate this as well? And it looks like one more. Uh, will there be more snag and drag programs involved to clear up creeks, streams, and rivers? And that is one we can make note of um, if we need to address that and come back to that at a later time. Um, and then I believe, let's see, does someone have their hand up? Uh, let's see, how do we, Dave, would you like to chime in with a, a question or a comment? I'm not sure, Amanda, do we have to give a guest uh, privilege to unmute or chime in if they have their hand up yeah that's a great question mike um i can't see because i'm sharing my screen but let me stop sharing my screen and get us back into the chat um, i'm actually not seeing someone's hand up so i don't know if it's a setting that you're seeing on your end that i'm not well, I saw a comment in the, the chat from Veronica that uh, it appeared that Dave C. had his hand up. Yes, so I do see I Veronica's. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, it's saying so Dave no longer has access to the chat. Could have been an accidental click, perhaps. Hmm. Uh, so at this point, I think, I know I kind of ran through those kind of quick I wanted to make sure that we got all the questions read. Were there any of these questions or comments that anyone else on the team 
would like to go back and address? I know we kind of had a, a lead um, responder on each one of those, kind of uh, Don or Adriana or myself, but uh, anyone else on the team have any comments uh, or responses to uh, any of the, the questions this evening? So it looks like they may be experiencing technical difficulties there where Don and Rachel are. Uh, I believe their computer may have frozen and they cannot unmute. So, um, Adriana, are you still with us? Okay, so it sounds like we may be uh, losing some of our um, connectivity here. But, uh, right, Adriana cannot unmute either. So um, we are at the top of the hour. I think that this was the scheduled time. Uh, so I will, uh, on behalf of the, the team, uh, thank everyone again for your attendance. Uh, we know your time is very valuable. Uh, thank you for the hour that you have shared with us uh, this evening. Uh, be sure to uh, be on the lookout for uh, those things that Amanda talked about, ways that you can participate. And um, with that, I believe we are adjourned. Thank you again for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you, everybody.